Welcome to Those Two Chicks with a Podcast. I'm Jordan. Today is True Crime Tuesday, and it is Emma Grace's turn. Before we begin, I would like to add a trigger warning that the following case contains early infant deaths towards the beginning, but then I will be mentioning some graphic details, including some sexual topics surrounding this case. If this type of material is hard for you to hear, please feel free to stop listening, and we hope to see you Friday. Now, one last thing. This case involves many names and takes place in three different states, so I will do my best to make it not confusing, but this is definitely a case that you need to pay attention to. So let's begin. Lowell Edwin Amos, who went by Ed, was born in Anderson, Indiana on January 4th, 1943. He was one of three kids and his parents were named Mary and Lowell Amos. His mother, Mary, was a high school teacher while his father, Lowell, was an engineer. Ed was said to have had what could be described as a normal childhood. He graduated from high school in 1960 and served two years in the Marines. He then went to work for the Delco Remy Division and eventually later on, he really worked his way up in the GM company. They had a plant in Anderson, Indiana, and he was one of the top people there. On December 8th, 1965, Ed got married to a woman named Sandra Hurd. Sandra was described as a friendly person, and she was also from Anderson, Indiana. And just like Ed's mother, Mary, Sandra too was a high school teacher. In 1971, Ed and Sandra welcomed their first son named Clifford, but unfortunately, he passed away nine days after he was born. They then had a son named John, who also passed away only 32 days after he was born. I will say that Sandra and Ed were able to have other children that did survive. There's not much on how many children they had, but at least two that we know of. On January 13th, 1979, Ed decided to run as a Republican for the mayoral seat in Anderson. On January 23rd, just 10 days later, Sandra spoke about Ed running at the Lady Elks Club meeting. Later at 10 p.m., Sandra went over to her neighbor's house, Connie, and shared a beer with her. Sandra proceeded to tell Connie that just recently, Ed took out a large life insurance policy on her. Connie teased Sandra that Ed might get rid of her so he can get the money. At 10.30 p.m., Sandra headed back home. Around 3 a.m., Connie woke up to the sound of someone pounding on her front door. When she went to open the door, she saw Sandra and Ed's two children. They told her, something is wrong with mommy and the ambulance is stuck in the snow. Connie's husband went to help free the ambulance and Connie went to go enter her neighbor's home. Connie entered and witnessed Ed burning something in the fireplace. He then told her he was burning Sandra's clothes because they were bloody. Ed went on to tell police that Sandra mixed a sedative with wine and collapsed in the bathroom. When she collapsed, she hit her head on the bathroom counter. When investigators discovered Sandra's naked body on the floor, there was no blood on her, on her body nor any visible blood in the bathroom in general. I did find articles that stated Connie told news reporters and police that Ed burned the clothes and they got her statement about the conversation of the life insurance policy. However, due to the mysterious circumstances, on January 25th, the newspaper reported that Sandra's death was a drug overdose. On that same day the newspaper article came out, Ed also announced that he was withdrawing from the political race. He stated he wanted to be with his kids at this time. The autopsy for Sandra showed that she had an abrasion near her eye and her lungs had fluid in them. Test results came back that the wine and the sedative was in her system. Ed collected a $350,000 life insurance policy from his wife's death. He then used the money to hire a nanny to take care of the children while he relocated to Middletown, Indiana for a little over a year. During this time, investigators continued to look into Sandra's death until one day when they received a letter from Ed's attorney forcing them to stop. Ed claimed he was being harassed and just wanted to be left alone. In the spring of 1980, just 14 months after Sandra's passing, Ed remarried to a woman named Carolyn Lawrence, who was a worker at the same company as Ed. Rumors spread that Ed and, and Carolyn had known each other for a while, and there was a possibility that they had an affair between the two of them while he was still married to Sandra. Their marriage seemed fine until 1988. Carolyn kicked Ed out of the house. Apparently, Carolyn found out that Ed took out a large life insurance policy on her. She demanded that he gets rid of the policy, but when Ed refused, Carolyn kicked him out, and Ed went to go live with his mother, Mary. At this time, Ed's father had passed away a few years before that. 
While living with his mother, a few weeks went by and Mary was rushed to the hospital. Doctors had no idea what was wrong with her. They couldn't find anything. She was able to return home. Carolyn would call frequently to check on her mother-in-law, but one day, Carolyn called and Ed answered. He then told Carolyn that his mother had passed away. Carolyn immediately came over and found Ed packing his things. He didn't want anyone to know that he was living with his mom, most likely to protect his image. Once he was done packing, Ed then called the police to report Mary's death. Mary was declared deceased at 5 a.m. on July 26, 1988. Mary was 77 years old and therefore no autopsy was performed. The cause of death was just old age. After his mother's death, Ed cashed in the life insurance policy he took on Mary. It was $1 million. However, had to be split because he's one of three children. It was at this time that Ed and Carolyn reunited. One day while in their home, Carolyn discovered a book titled How to Kill People. She showed her son Gary as this scared her. At 12.05 a.m. on April 6, 1989, Carolyn was dead. However, Ed was in no rush to report her death. By the time police arrived at the house, Carolyn's body was cold to the touch. Ed began to tell police what transpired that night. Ed and Carolyn went to dinner that night, and once they came home, Carolyn had a glass of wine. She took the wine to the bathroom, and she was blow-drying her hair. This also has been said that it's a curling iron, but there has been multiple articles what it was. When Ed came in to check on her, she was on the floor. Ed believed she had electrocuted herself, maybe from a frayed wire. Police began their investigation, discovered the wine glass rinsed out and in the dishwasher. They also found a rag that smelled terrible. An autopsy was performed and there was no sign of electrocution. The house also came back with no known wiring issues. They ran many tests and thoughts and theories came up to maybe Carolyn was smothered since there was frothing around her mouth, but not much was done and it was left as an unusual circumstance of death. After Carolyn's death, Ed cashed the life insurance policy on her that was worth $800,000. Ed then met a woman named Roberta Murray, who went by Bobby, who was also an employee at the company he worked at. They ended up getting married on March 6, 1993. Ed was 50 at this time and Bobby was 36. It was stated that Bobby had been married before Ed. She got married when she was 18 and had one son, but it was a short marriage. Ed took his pension at work and moved to Detroit, Michigan for better opportunities. Bobby and her son stayed at an apartment in Indiana. Ed started a new business with a new partner named Burt. They were dealing with some high-risk loans, and Ed was enjoying his life. He had money, looks. Many articles stated that he kept up with plastic surgery so he could keep his youthfulness, and he had a wife that was a state away. In December of 1994, Ed and Bobby attended a holiday party in Greektown in Detroit. They ate, drank, and partied until they finally returned to their hotel room at 2 a.m. I would also like to mention they were using cocaine. At 8 a.m., Ed called his business partner, Bert, and insisted he come over. Bert arrived at 9.30 a.m. with another employee named Daniel. Ed told the both of them that he and Bobby were using cocaine and she overdosed. He needed time to clean the room before calling the police. Ed handed Daniel a bag and told him to take it home with him. Daniel did. He did, however, look inside the bag to discover some odd items. There was a six-inch syringe filled with yellow liquid, but the needle was missing. There was also a men's blazer and a hotel washcloth that smelled horrible. And these items would never be found again. Ed then called the front desk. Detroit police came and found Bobby's body on the bed covered with a sheet. Ed told police that they had partied the night before. They did drink quite a bit and drugs were involved. Ed did mention to the police that they had participated in a cocaine sex game. Ed snorted the cocaine, but Bobby inserted it anally and vaginally due to sinus issues. He then said he wanted to sleep, but Bobby stayed up and continued using. When Ed woke up at 5 a.m., Bobby was deceased. He told police he flushed the cocaine because he was worried about the drug charges. Police brought Ed in for, for more questioning, and once he was released, Ed went back to the hotel room and went to the safe where he grabbed Bobby's Rolex watch. Then he went to Burton, and they headed to meet Daniel as well to retrieve the bag. 
When Bobby's death made the news, phone calls came into the station about the previous wife's death as well as Ed's mother's death. Other women called stating that they had sex with Ed and they truly believed that Ed drugged them before they had intercourse. Two days after Bobby's passing, Ed spent $1,000 in Detroit bar hopping and eating out and he ended up having two women in his bed by the next morning. Bobby's autopsy came back and she had two small bruises and an abrasion on her forehead. The amount of cocaine in her body was 3.7. It was the highest level of cocaine the coroner has ever seen. It was roughly about 14 or 15 times the average level of death from a cocaine overdose. But even some of the cocaine was found in her, that was found in her body wasn't even broken down. Her blood alcohol level was 0.08. Bobby's cause of death was cocaine poisoning. However, due to the high level of cocaine, she wouldn't be able to do that herself. She would have needed some sort of assistance. They also were, were able to note there were no needle marks or evidence of previous drug use. Ed claimed that he went to sleep while Bobby stayed up and continued. However, Bobby would not have died quietly in her sleep. She would have experienced nervousness, agitation, and hyperactivity. She could have also been having violent fits, but apparently Ed slept through that. Not to mention, he was also using cocaine, but that didn't affect him somehow. But coroners believe that Bobby would have passed away with the half of that amount that was in her before more was inserted in her. One of the pillows in the hotel room was smeared with makeup. However, Bobby's face was clean when they found her. When they looked closer at the pillow, they found teeth marks, making them believe that Bobby was smothered and she fought for her life. The bed sheet was also covered in cocaine residue. But here's the thing, traces of cocaine were found vaginally, but not anal or oral. With this information, it is believed that the cocaine was in liquid form and definitely someone tried to clean her up before police arrived. Michigan police interviewed Bobby's family, and her mother and sister were suspicious of the overdose as Bobby was against drug use. Her mother said she also worked for Ed for years and heard the rumors of the previous wives and Mary. She was concerned and told Bobby that she didn't think it was a great idea, but Bobby married Ed anyways. At this point, police knew Ed was lying, but there wasn't enough evidence to charge him with murder. Ed then relocated once again to Las Vegas, Nevada. Police knew they needed something to charge Ed with, so they decided to team up with the Indiana police to find out more about Ed's past relationships. It was discovered that Bobby was unhappy in the marriage and bought a house for her and her son using her maiden name. It was also stated that Bobby found out that Ed was having an affair with a woman named Mary. Mary told Ed that it was either her or Bobby and to end the marriage. However, Mary wasn't the only person Ed was seeing on the side. Police also found out that by 1994, Ed was pretty much broke. The new business with Bert was, was losing them money, and Bobby's mom said that between her and Bobby, they loaned Ed $50,000 over the couple of years. In November of 1995, Ed was arrested in Vegas for the murder of Bobby Amos and was charged with two counts of first-degree murder. By September 1996, the trial started. The main purpose of this case was to determine, was it an overdose or a murder? Prosecutors were limited with what they could discuss or introduce as evidence. They were only allowed to talk about Bobby's case and Carolyn's, but not Sandra's or Mary's. And this is the reason why Carolyn's case was open for discussion. Both Bobby and Carolyn had a similar case. Ed, for both wives, did not rush to report them to police. Both deaths were labeled as accidental, though evidence suggested otherwise. Both crime scenes were cleaned up in some way, either the wine glass in the dishwasher with Carolyn and Bobby being cleaned up as well. And lastly, Ed was the last person they were with and the first person to find them deceased. But there were two differences in both of these cases. One, Carolyn's body had no trace of cocaine. And two, there was no life insurance policy taken out for Bobby. The trial was messy and it was found out that police arrested Ed for not only the intention of Bobby's murder, but also the other wives and his mother in mind when they asked him, which as we know, 
they couldn't do that. Only Bobby's murder and Carolyn's could be discussed. So it was then a mistrial, but prosecutors appealed. They believed that Ed didn't kill Bobby for financial gain, but for the fear of knowing she was going to leave him and he didn't like the thought of being publicly rejected. Another theory, if you wanted to look at all three wives' deaths, is that it could be a way for him to have a clean divorce. Prosecutors couldn't stress this enough. No one can be that unlucky. Ed had to murder them for either money or convenience. Ed did take the stand to defend himself. It did not go well. Prosecutors brought in a duffel bag that included a variety of sexual objects and tools. It's claimed that Bobby and Ed used them that night, so they asked Ed to take them out and explain their uses. The point of this was to find out how that much cocaine was injected vaginally into Bobby. So what they did was they grabbed the object, they had a bag of flour to represent cocaine. And if that wasn't possible to get that much cocaine, they're going back to the idea of a liquid form using a syringe. But Ed really couldn't deny that he didn't report the body as fast enough as the others. He also tampered with the crime scene evidence and he couldn't deny that either. So his defense team was saying that Bobby didn't have the life insurance policy taken out, so why would he want to kill her? Well, if Ed wanted another woman, would that matter? And if they did divorce, then he would need to split everything with Bobby. On October 24th, 1996, Ed was found guilty of two counts of first degree murder. It was said his arrogance made him easy to prosecute. On November 4th, 1996, he was sentenced to two life terms. However, Ed remained his innocence. Even Ed's son, Ed Jr. defended his father. A lot of people thought Ed was just this poor widowed man that was so unlucky. He tried to appeal and he said that being charged with two counts of first degree murder was double jeopardy. Ed believed they didn't have any witnesses of the actual murder. It was just all these people they called in that said, yes, they wanted a story of Ed did this, Ed did that. Yep, Ed had sex with me. He went and got the slap dance and said that he committed these crimes. Mm -hmm. And the jury was acting on emotions. The court agreed. And on August 18th, 1998, the Court of Appeals affirmed his conviction, but ordered amended sentence. He was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. He served a full sentence at Lakeland Correctional Facility in Coldwater, Michigan, and passed away in prison on January 5th, 2022. If this case is familiar to you, you might recall the 2006 Lifetime movie that is based around Ed Amos called The Black Widower. And that's the case of Lowell Ed Amos. Wow. So at this time, we're going to have our takeaways. A lot of people are wondering, like, so how did Indiana not prosecute this guy? I don't And you have to think, well, he was running right. for mayor at a time, and he was well-liked. He was popular. He had the looks. He he got women. He couldn't keep Essentially them. Essentially like a rich, white, but... powerful man getting away with things uh -huh. again. <laughs> and I, it's like if the Michigan police did not look into Bobby's death more, mm -mm. nothing would have happened. Right. I feel like they let a lot of things go, mm -hmm. you know, even with the first death. Right. Wouldn't you think you would investigate a little bit if somebody said, uh, right. you know, he claims there's blood, but there's no blood? Well, even, Also, why would you be burning the bloody clothes? Yeah. Like, why? And That's they were weird. just like, uh, I don't know. It's, just... it's not really something like a grieving, like who just found out his wife is like dead. No. What? I just don't get that. It's just such an interesting case of, it is. like, how so many things were just overlooked. And even Carolyn's death. Mm -hmm. I mean, he washed a wine glass. Yeah. And there was no electrocution. That was the reason that he died. And they were just like, she oh, died. okay, well, random. Yeah. That's crazy. It, weird. But even poor Mary, I mean, I understand they're probably, like, at 77 years old. Yeah. It's pretty common. Don't they still investigate that, though? I would assume I mean, maybe they not an autopsy, but I just right. Feel like I think that was the thing. Don't but you have to do cause of death on the death certificate? You do, and it was natural causes. But here's the thing: this is what I think. Mm -hmm. I find it a little suspicious that Ed took Mary to the hospital just a little bit ago. Mm -hmm. Nothing was wrong with her. Yeah. But Ed is such a manipulative person. If he said no, you should really go. Like even yeah. she's like, oh my back hurts or something hurts. Oh, go to the hospital. This you mm -hmm. know at your age anything could happen. Yeah. Well now if we look at Mary's death. She was in the hospital not long after she died. Mm -hmm. So before? Before she died, yes. Yeah. 
So really, she went to the hospital Mm -hmm. for something that she was sick, and then she passed away. That's not weird. Right. Yeah. That's no, not I see what odd you're saying. Anything. People would probably think like, oh yeah, well she did. And also like Ed, t- Ed took her to the hospital, so that's yeah. a caring son. Yeah. I mean, I guess I could get why a guy back then would want to pack his stuff because he wouldn't want people to know he's living with his mom. But also, I just find that yeah. really suspicious. I think it was more so that he didn't want the cops to know that he oh, was I, staying I with his mom. I think it was a mixture of both. Yeah. I think, I mean, this guy had a huge ego. Yeah. We know this. Yeah. Um, so... Really. I mean, he has plastic surgery to keep up mm-hmm. this facade that he's this go-getter. But, I mean, yeah. he was spending money left and right. But you have to look at, I think, I mean, there was, like, the Detroit Free Press. I think they picked up an article about him mm-hmm. spending all this money when they were looking into the um That's a lot of money to go through back then. Right. And just in the $1,000, two days after his wife dies mm-hmm. and he picks up two women. Yeah. You know that he wasn't interested. You know what bothers me the most, I think, though, is that people were talking about how weird this was. Yeah. There were so many rumors. And I, you know, I get maybe back then they, they probably didn't think, like, oh, I should probably, like, talk to the cops about this. But if you know somebody had mm-hmm. three wives die, had their mother die, and it was all suspicious, don't you think you would be like, hey. Right. It uh, wasn't for Bobby's family to be like, no, weird. this is not, this is not the thing. Yeah. But just being like. Okay, it might just be a rumor, yeah. and maybe he is that unlucky, but who is that unlucky? unlucky like, that really, I would get it if, if the deaths weren't so suspicious. Like, yeah, maybe right. someone really is that unlucky, but, like, right. Well, even, like, the Lion sedative, sure, mm-hmm. that makes sense. I yeah. think for them it was just that drug overdose. It was easy, it was fast, and yeah. case closed. Yeah. And that's the thing, too. They said there was no blood found, but she'd have a small abrasion, so he must have cleaned that up. Yeah. For sure. Oh, yeah. And it's funny how most of them did have the small abrasion somewhere on their heads. Mm-hmm. Like, I wonder what that was from. Right. You know, I just, it's probably also the fact that he was moving to different cities. And, you know, you have different corners and whatever in each city, whatever. Right. So they just must not have connected the dots. Because if it was around the same area, I'm sure that they the would be like, one, I would think weird? that they would find kind of odd, except mm-hmm. for Mary's, because I think that one can be kind of explained yeah for an average yes. person that's not looking at this case in full but wouldn't it be weird because carolyn and sandra mm-hmm. same place oh it was the same city yeah oh that's very weird mm-hmm. i don't know why they didn't and well, probably because of his influence honestly yeah. oh i think so too you know and if he's a good schmoozer you know well, i think probably he was is. good at talking things away. well a lot of people were like when he got convicted and he was mm-hmm. sent to prison and everything people were like yeah watch out for ed because he's going to be the most manipulative person you'll ever meet. So don't trust anybody. Well, it's, it's just so sad because even Bobby's mother mm-hmm. was like, I really don't think you should go through with this. Like, yeah. look at the facts. He's had two wives that mysteriously died. Right. But you have to think yeah. about all these children. I know. And it's like, what kind of father does That's that? so sad. Like Someone only a narcissist? Right. <laughs> but he's only technically convicted for Bobby's. And I think just the talk of Carolyn, I don't know mm-hmm. if it was ever... Yeah. really declared but he is innocent for sandra's death and his mother's it's crazy mm-hmm. that's so crazy well that was a really interesting case yeah and he just passed that. away this year i don't know if something's suspicious really protect your loved ones i know you don't have to take rumors you know as something yeah. serious because rumors are rumors but if there's something that really gives you a bad feeling and really mm-hmm. just seems off nothing more wrong with doing an anonymous tip no. Nothing wrong with it. If they don't follow up, that's, you know, whatever. At least mm-hmm. with your conscience, it can be off yeah. your mind. And, you know, you really could be protecting somebody. Well, you know, and a lot of people have gone into this, you know, psychological study of him even. Yeah. And it's so interesting because he had a normal childhood. Yeah. And you know what a lot of these, I'm not saying all of them, but you find a lot of them where that trauma kicked in. They're like, well, maybe we can tie it back into something. Yeah. That wasn't with him. Right. He was so nature versus nurture. What is mm -hmm. it at that point? You know? Right. So is it just something that he found he really liked women and it was an easy way to for he just really wanted the money and the fast lifestyle. Yeah. Yeah. So it was easier to kill them off instead of divorcing them and risking that and just move on. Yeah. I mean that's what it kinda sounds like. But there was nothing in his childhood or growing up or anything even community or family wise. No one thought, I think that's probably why a lot of people think he's innocent. Mm-hmm. You know, because you look at that of some of these violent crimes. So people about. think he's like genuinely innocent of all of them. Oh, yeah. Wow. 
And I think it's just because you have to, a lot of people try tying back their childhood or growing Mm -hmm. up or who they were. That wasn't it. Right. So it's just like, you really don't know anyone. (laughs) Yeah, <laughs> like you, you really, really don't, don't. Uh, and I hate to say that like n- to not trust anybody but you really do not know anybody you don't and that's just something I think this case proves it yeah that everyone was so shocked that yeah. he could have done something like this that's crazy well you guys let us know what you think yeah we're curious sure. but yeah all right thank you Emma you're welcome uh and we will see you guys Friday we have a wild card episode so if you need something mm-hmm. a little lighter to cleanse your palate before the weekend Uh, Join us on Friday. All right. Bye. Bye.